Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. This is one of a series of short videos looking at the American political system. In this video, we're going to explore the idea of the social contract and social contract theory and examine its impact on and integration into the political system of the United States. Most of us are familiar, at least on some level, with the words of the Declaration of Independence. Written by Thomas Jefferson and adopted by the Second Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776, the document outlines the reason why the 13 colonies were at war with the British Crown. Some even had to memorize portions of the Declaration of Independence in elementary school. But for our purposes today, let's focus in detail on the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That when any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. The principles embodied in the Declaration of Independence are a clear representation of the social contract theory of government. Indeed, social contract theory was one of the hottest ideas of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. In its simplest form, social contract theory begins with the idea of a state of nature, a social condition that predates the formation of the state, before society, before rules and norms, limited individual behavior. While we might be tempted to think of this state of nature as a realm of pure freedom, most social contract theorists argue that such systems actually limited freedom due to the conflict and insecurity that resulted from it. In the words of Thomas Hobbes, one of the leading early social contract theorists, the state of nature was one of constant conflict, insecurity, and war. According to Hobbes, in the state of nature, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently no culture of the earth, no navigation nor use of commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious buildings, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge in the face of earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Because the state of nature is so abhorrent to human progress and well-being, social contract theorists contend that we give up a degree of our freedom in order to secure a government that performs a number of important functions, including protecting life, liberty, and property, guaranteeing a meaningful and moral community, achieving compromise, cooperation, and coexistence among individuals with competing goals and interests, enabling the provision of public goods, managing finite resources, tax negative externalities like pollution, and subsidize positive externalities like education or common defense, and protect against unforeseen future crises and crises that require a collective response. At the time the Declaration of Independence was drafted, there were three primary social contract theorists, each of which put a slightly different spin on the state of nature and implications of the contract. Thomas Hobbes, who we've already mentioned, viewed the social contract as a one-time event in which individuals collectively granted the state the right of rule, effectively giving up freedom for safety and security. John Locke, who was probably the most influential or the most directly influential in the thinking of the founders on the topic, believed that the government's legitimacy is derived from the citizens' delegation of authority and power to the state, and that importantly, that delegation of authority could be revoked if the state no longer operated in the interests of the people. Finally, the French political theorist Jean-Jacques Rousseau tended to make a more collectivist approach to the social contract, emphasizing the importance of the general will, which reversed Hobbes's and Locke's more uh, individualistic approach. And so returning to the Declaration of Independence, we see the social contract theory implicitly evoked in a number of ways. The idea of inalienable rights, that is, of rights that exist independently of the state and in fact predate the creation of the state itself. 
and specifically in the idea that these rights include the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Indeed, in writing the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson essentially plagiarized John Locke's two treaties on government. In that book, Locke argued that human beings were born with certain inalienable rights, which could never be abridged or taken away, and that these rights were the right to life, liberty, and property. Now, when Locke and Jefferson were writing, such rights were circumscribed, belonging only to the propertied white men largely. We explore this contradiction elsewhere in the course. But the idea of inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness in Jefferson's formulation, were drawn directly from social contract theory. Social contract theory also posits that the governments are created through a contract and that they derive their power from the consent of the governed, again, again a theme that we find in the writings of John Locke and others. And finally, the idea that when governments fail to deliver on their purpose, that the people retain the right to change the existing political order and replace it with a new system better able to meet their needs and desires. This is also a central idea of the social contract. We'll return to a number of these issues as we move through the course, but that's it for now. Please leave any questions you have in the comment section below, and thanks for watching. Bye.